So in this lecture, I want to speak a little bit about torsion. And the reason is because it's one of those things in general relativity that sort of appears as a, well, it's an ansatz, as I said, which is sort of an assumption that we make in order to hope that it becomes true, self-evidently true later. But it's also, um, it's the most complex assumption, I think. Um, there's a lot of assumptions that go into the building of GR, but this one is a complex assumption. Um, and it sort of catches people by surprise because it looks arbitrary, right? And all of these things are an obstruction to understanding and learning. Um, the problem being that when you're learning a subject and a lot of things come along that look arbitrary, are, assum are assumed, and you wouldn't normally have assumed it had you been tasked with deriving the theory, and they're not easy to understand. And the more of these things that are thrown at you while you're learning something, the more separated you are from the material itself. And in general relativity, we've already done a bunch of things like that. I mean, imagine if I had started by saying, okay, we're going to study GR and space-time, first of all, is a four-dimensional manifold. Oh, and it's got a Lorentz uh, geometry, right? And, but it's a local Lorentz geometry, and of course, I have to quickly teach you just enough about manifolds to understand what a local Lorentz geometry means. And then I, uh, I tell you on top of that that, um, oh, particles... Uh, particles move on geodesics, right? I tell you that one, right? And um, uh, I assert the Einstein equivalence principle, which is really sort of a restatement of that. And then I tell you, oh, and by the way, the torsion, the torsion of the connection on the manifold, I guess when I just talk about the connection as a single symbol, I should use this. The torsion of the connection on the manifold is zero, right? So if we had just started with that and we didn't go through what is a tensor and what is a manifold, this would be confusing. And in fact, in most general relativity books, uh, they do talk about manifolds, but they do it so so quickly that you know you're missing a lot. And so you kind of feel awkward about that. And this you understand to the very degree that you understand special relativity. If you really, really have a good, good grasp on special relativity, this isn't so hard. But the notion of it being local on a manifold, that's actually kind of a confusing point unless you really understand manifolds. Um, the fact that particles move along geodesics, I think people can absorb that idea pretty well. The problem is understanding that geodesics have to be in a four-dimensional manifold, which involves the time coordinate, so that these geodesics are not just spatial movements, but they're also time movement. And then this thing, this thing just like comes totally out of the blue. So even if you work through all of this, even the way I presented it, you know, and I'm, I'm the guy who's trying to say, okay, we've got to really get our hands around this. We've got to really get our head around this. We've got to understand these geodesics. We've got to understand every little damn thing, right? And then even I come and say, hey, out of the blue, the torsion of the, of the, um, the torsion of our connection is going to be zero. So this one's kind of tough. And the, uh, the truth is, is that the idea of torsion is so deeply embedded into the components of the connection, right? And there's a lot of these components, right? There's four, four, and four of them. So that's four times four is 16 times four, right? So that's, that's a lot of components. And the relationship between these components can, is pretty complex. And, and there's, no, there's no a priori restriction on what these components can be. Now, we do establish the slight prediction by demanding that we, that we have metric compatibility, right? So once we demand this, that does constrict this considerably. 
So, but it's not a heck of a, it's not so much, right? You can still have uh, a metric that, um, you know, it's still possible that you end up with uh, this idea. The, the fact that torsion goes away is still relevant, right? Even with this constriction, even with this uh, uh, restriction. So I thought I would just talk a little bit about torsion and uh, most people who study general relativity don't know a heck of a lot about it because it's, a, it's an important idea in differential geometry, um, but, uh, and it's definitely an important idea in some modified versions of general relativity called, uh, 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 there's a, there, there are a variety of modifications to general relativity that in, include torsion. Uh, I'll refer to a paper uh, before we're done here. And also, uh, some string theory involves torsion. And torsion, you can think the word itself means spinning or twisting, or, and uh, indeed a lot of ideas about how angular momentum of fundamental particles interacting with space-time uh, might involve uh, adding torsion back into general relativity. But let's get an idea of why we can omit the torsion and what the torsion do for us if it wasn't omitted. This isn't going to be comprehensive. It's just a little bit to, to get past this absolute arbitrary uh, 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 fiat statement that the torsion will be zero. Okay, so let's begin. So we start with the statement that we made previously, that we asserted that this had to equal zero. And then in the last lecture, we showed that what this implied was that the connection was symmetric in the bottom two indices, right? So let's imagine for a moment that that's not the case, right? That this is not true and this is not zero. We're going to define this object as the torsion, and I'll give it a capital T, and it's an object that takes two vectors, right? So it takes a vector x, a vector y, and it gives you this output, which presumably is not zero anymore. Now notice that this thing is going to be a mapping, but it's not a tensor mapping. Instead, it's a mapping, T is a mapping, that takes the Cartesian product of, of a vector field and a vector field on the space-time. That's what this represents. This is the set of all vector fields on a space-time. And the Cartesian product of all the vector fields on the space-time, just product with itself, and it gives you another vector field. So literally, going back to the definition of the Cartesian product, I require a vector field S, or X, and a vector field Y. Uh, actually, I shouldn't use tau. tau. I was using tau as a parameter for a curve, but I'm talking about vector fields, right? So um, a vector field X on the space-time with coordinate point x, a vector field y on the space-time with coordinate point x, and that should give me a vector field z on the space-time. Right, so I take two vector fields and I get a third vector field. Now that's not a tensor, but it's what we are going to call the torsion, and it is a mapping. Now something important about the torsion is that uh, if I take the torsion and I take a function on the space-time, I'm going to drop the space-time dependence, two functions on the space-time like this, I'm going to get the function on the space-time times the function on the space-time times the torsion of x and y. And it's not too hard to see, right? Going through the definition, you get dgx, oops, not g, right? Uh, f x, g, y minus partial g, y, f, x minus f, x, g, y, right, you get, and that's going to equal f partial x, g, y plus partial um, oops, not plus, it's minus partial, or G, Y, F, X, 
and then this is going to be what? Minus fx operating on gy plus gy operating on fx. And that's going to equal, now I have to break this down, I have to break this down using the uh, uh, Leibniz rule, which for uh, the uh, derivative operator there. So that's going to be f times partial xg on y plus g covariant derivative in the direction x. I say partial all the time. I'm not quite sure why I'm stuck on doing that. So that's that term. And then likewise, it's minus g times the covariant derivative of y of f act, acting on x um, plus uh, f times the covariant derivative of y of x. And then it's minus, let me see, this part here now has to be same principle, right? We're going to get the uh, differential operators again acting on things, so they use the Leibniz rule. Uh, so that will be uh, minus f times uh, x acting on g, y. Right, f acting on g y plus uh, g x after y plus g, and then it's the same deal. It's y acting on f x plus f y after x, like that. And then this equals. See, there should be a lot of cancellations, right? The uh, what we should see canceling are is this this here, this term here, and that term there is simply the uh, uh, is is x acting on g and y acting on f. So this is f times x acting on g times y, which is f, which is, so that term cancels with that term. You've got to under, we've got to remember that this, right, is the, uh, the covariant derivative in the direction of x of a function on the space-time is simply the um, uh, vector phi, the vector at that point acting on the function, right? So, so this term cancels with that term. And likewise, uh, um, likewise, g y of f x g y of f x. So that term cancels with that term, All right? So there's that. And then, uh, what do we have next? We have. So then we have. We have uh, g f g times y x and f g times x y with a minus sign, so that ends up being f g times uh, x y minus y x with a minus sign in front. So that would be minus fxy plus yx, right? So that takes care of that term and that term. And then we're left with fg covariant derivative in direction x of y, fg covariant derivative in direction of y of x. So we have fg xy minus yx, like that. And um, so therefore, we have T of fx, gy equals, uh, so the, F and, the point is it's this is linear in functions f and g. They just pop out and you get the same thing back, right? I guess I should, I guess I should have written this as, instead of that, I should have written it like this.
<clears throat> right? Which equals f g t x y. Okay, so the point is it's linear like that. It's linear in x and y. That's an important thing to show because we're going to turn this idea, this torsion, we're going to turn the torsion, this thing here, into a tensor. Right now it's not a tensor, it's just a mapping from um, vector spaces to vector space. But if we gave this an extra uh, one form or a covector, then we could we could uh, have that covector map this vector to a real number, and then the whole thing would be mapping um, a covector. Then this whole thing would take two vectors and a covector and map a real number, right? So if you take two vectors and a covector to map to a real number, that is an element of the 1, 2 tensor product space on the manifold, right? Because it, this will take, this is, this, this is, this guy here is going to have basis vectors of uh, partial alpha tensor product dx beta tensor product dx gamma, and of course that's going to gobble up two vectors and a covector to give a real number. So we need to add these. So we need to add a uh, we need to to add a covector to the mapping, which is the same as adding a vector to the uh, tensor product space we're looking for. So that's sort of the idea here. And now that we know it's linear, we know at least this part of it is linear here. So now we know we can simply create, since it's, a, since it's all right, so since this is linear, we know that, uh, we know that um, our tensor has to be linear in that piece. We know that whatever we do to, to generate this tensor, adding a, uh, another tensor product piece onto it isn't going to change the linearity, and so we're going to be able to generate a tensor out of this. And all we have to do is define the thing, and that's what we'll do right now. Let me put it, uh, I mean, I'll go up here where we're on top of things. All right, this is our definition of the torsion tensor, where we take the torsion and we simply use a dual space mapping on providing, we provide some covector, and then we execute the dual space mapping on the torsion, which is a vector, right? It lands in the vector space, and that dual space mapping gives us a real number. So therefore, the torsion takes two vectors and returns a, uh, two vectors and a covector returns a real number. And we know that it's linear because we know that if we added G and F here, we ended up with G and F here, right? But that could be pulled out to G and F here, which can be pulled out to G and F here, which is the linearity that we seek. And we certainly know that if we put H here and H here, that H would come out. So it's definitely linearity all over the place, so everything's fine. But we did have to check, right? We did have to check that the torsion map was, in fact, linear. Okay, so, so this is our definition of the torsion tensor now. And um, it is important to understand this is a vector, right? This guy here is a vector. And if, it, if you're wondering about that, just pull it back into comp notation, x alpha, um, the covariant derivative of y with respect to the index alpha, the, this alpha and this alpha are dummies that cancel out, leaving one contravariant index, which is a vector. So it's easy to see that that first term is a vector. The, um, this commutator over here, or this Lie bracket, uh, that needs to be understood as x, y, minus y x. And whenever you see these um, these these vectors or vector fields is what these are, these vector fields kind of combined like this, you always have to understand and imagine that there's a test function out there and it's operating on a text function. And so this thing is going to be x times y operating on the text function minus y times x operating on the test function. And a differential operator operating on a test function gives you another function, which can then be fed to that. So ultimately, uh, this will represent, these two things will represent vectors also, because they're fed functions, and they return other functions. Um, 
so when, when you see them, when, you, when, they, when they are fed a function, the final result is going to be um, uh, this vector. Uh, I guess the way to say it, the, way to, the correct way to say it is this, this object is an object that eats a function and returns a function, which is what a vector does. So this, this guy here, this torsion, is a vector. Um, and therefore, and then this guy here is a, a tensor, and it's a, a 1, 2 rank tensor. So we can imagine it being written as T, alpha, beta, gamma, partial alpha, tensor product, dx, beta, tensor product, dx, gamma, in full generality, in full generality. But we don't want full generality. We want to know exactly what its components are in the comp notation. So whenever we want to convert from the, when we want to convert from C free to comp, we just plug in the unit vectors into the C free. So we're going to try to evaluate, let me go back to black here. We're going to try to evaluate T, D, X, uh, let's say alpha, I'm just partial beta, partial gamma. Right? We're going to evaluate that, and what we're going to end up with is if we, if we take, and I'll let you do this, but if we take these and we plug them into here, and I guess I'll do the first step, what you'll end up with is, well, we'll plug them into the definition, right? So dx alpha on this side, then we have to put this part of the definition, which is all right here, and we would write uh, this... Um, uh, x would be, I guess, beta. I'll leave the partial out. I could write partial beta because I'm trying to get the the vector x would be partial beta, but I'm going to leave out the partial. Most books do, and I think we should get rid, of, get used to that notation. So this, I should write this is the same as that, right? Because you need a vector in the subscript to follow. The logic of the um, to follow the logic of the C, C free notation. So, just keep that in mind. So, it'll, but it's I'm running. It's it's also just a little more economical with with space. And then that would be. Uh, but here I can't with I I have to maintain that gamma there. Um, and then it's minus partial gamma or covariant derivative in the direction. Cam of, of y, which is the unit vector there, and this will be partial beta, and then, then we have the commutator partial beta partial gamma, right? And that that uh, that is our component expression, and then ultimately, th this guy we recognize as well. Here I really should. If, just so you recognize it, it should be partial beta, partial gamma, which we've already defined as uh, the connection coefficient. This is by through definition the connection coefficient alpha, gamma, beta, partial alpha, right? A vector. And likewise for this guy, you can make the same substitution where, of course, you get instead of gamma beta, you'll get beta gamma. And this guy here, uh, just um, uh, that guy goes to zero, the, the, uh, because mixed partial derivatives, mixed normal partials commute, right? So you're going to get you're going to get partial beta, partial gamma minus partial gamma, partial beta, and those two will just simply uh, cancel out. So you end up with the difference between two connection coefficients when you make the substitution in here, which is of course what we discovered last time, right? Uh, we, the implication of this was we, we we actually did this whole exercise last time I think almost we didn't uh, we didn't create this tensor but uh, we we evaluated this and uh, ultimately now um, uh, when you make all of this substitutions uh, I guess I should finish it up over here and here I just sort of wrote it out the uh, the tensor. Um, Plugging in the unit vectors gives you, by definition, the component, right? That's a real number. This thing's being fed a covector vector and a vector, so that's a real number. 
That real number is the dual space mapping defined here that we've chosen to make as our definition. And uh, uh, we've already evaluated this part. We already evaluated this part here uh, in this area, understanding that that canceled out. And we ended up with this. This, by definition, is the connection. The, these are the definitions of the connection coefficients, right? Just as a reminder, right, it's the covariant derivative in the direction of a unit vector given by index beta of the unit vector given by index gamma. That's what this coefficient is. So we've got the difference in these coefficients, and it's a vector. So this is a function on the space-time, so it comes out. Remember, everything's a function of space-time, so just remember these are all fields. There's suppressed, there's always suppressed, you know, uh, space-time arguments in there, right? And um, this comes out, leaving just the uh, just this dual space mapping, which of course is delta alpha kappa, and so ultimately this whole thing just equals gamma. Uh, I guess uh, I'll just leave the kappa. I guess I can choose beta minus gamma kappa uh, beta gamma. So. So what you see is, which is also, by the way, more conveniently written like this, kappa, and then you have these anti-commutators, gamma, beta, like that, right? Um, where, just uh, to be clear, gamma, kappa, uh, or connection coefficient, gamma, beta, that's defined as one-half of gamma, kappa, gamma beta minus kappa beta gamma over, oops, it's this. That's the definition of this thing. And uh, the anti-symmetration, we'll start, be, you'll see a lot more of that as we move on. But the point is, is ultimately the torsion, the components of the torsion tensor, right, uh, beta gamma, right, equals gamma, well, it equals 2 times kappa gamma beta. Now notice, this is an actual tensor notation on this side, right? You have a space right here, and this thing is a tensor. This guy here is not a tensor. However, their difference, obviously, is a tensor, right? Because you can't have a tensor on one side and not a tensor on the other. So this difference is a tensor, which means if you did a tensor transformation on this difference, the part of this that doesn't act tens transform tensorially and the part of that that doesn't trans transfer transform tensorially will cancel. So this guy is a tensor. However, uh, we still write it, and let me write it a little more clearly. We still write it as though... Um, uh, it were not, right? In other words, we write two, I, or let's, let me put it this way, I write it as though it were not, uh, gamma, beta, meaning I don't leave, I don't leave room for this alpha to drop down, like there is room here for the alpha to drop down, right? There's a space right there. Um, I don't, because what I'm really saying is this is a formula, this is a formula to calculate the tensor component, right? So, uh, now, other books do do it that way, right? Other books do leave room. Other books would be 2 gamma alpha, and then it would be, uh, it would look like that. There would be room. And then there's other books, and I think I mentioned this before, where it's, where it's really bad because, well, the, in fact, the catalog is like this, where uh, they actually leave it uh, gamma beta, but they expect you to drop the alpha over here, Right? Uh, I'm a little worried about that because I wanted to lean on the, uh, the catalog pretty heavily, but I'm afraid it's going to conflict with just about every other book I use um, with uh, one or two, with one exception. But uh, we'll just have to stay on top of it. The point is, is that this is the components of the torsion tensor, right? This is the components of the torsion tensor. Now, I did all that because the, one of the things to keep in mind is that the connection alpha, beta, gamma 
is going to equal its symmetric and anti-symmetric part. Alpha, beta, gamma, plus alpha, gamma. This is anti-symmetric part. Now, normally the anti-symmetric part is zero, right? That is the presumption of, of general relativity. And that's because and that the implication for that is that the torsion tensor is zero, right? This guy is always going to be zero. And the implication for that is that the torsion alpha beta gamma, which equals two times the anti-symmetric part of the connection, gamma, beta, right? We know that the anti-symmetric part in general relativity of the connection is zero, um, and uh, therefore um, the torsion is zero, right? So the connection equals its symmetric part in general relativity. But we have this anti-symmetric part that we're, that's floating around in our imaginations now. And what I guess I want to understand is that when we go back to these assumptions in, in general relativity, this one is a big deal. Particles move on geodesics. So calculating the geodesics for a metric is really, really important. And what we can now show, and we're, we're on the verge of showing, is that with or without torsion, Right? The geodesics of this connection depend only on the symmetric part of the connection. So even if we had a torsion, even if we had a torsion, the ge geodesics would be the same. Right? So let's have a look at that demonstration. I, it's not very difficult, but uh, it's definitely worth seeing and understanding the implications. What I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate I'm going to calculate the following value. The covariant derivative in the direction of x of y plus the covariant derivative in the direction of y of x. Notice not minus. Before we did minus, right? in the definition of the torsion, we had this minus sign. Now we're going to do it with a plus sign. And let me start working this out. Uh, with this substitution, I'm no longer going to assume that the uh, that the anti-symmetric part of the connection is zero, and I'm not going to make that assumption. And let's see where that gets us. All right. So what I've what I've done is this term here, the covariant derivative of the vector y with respect to x. Well, that's going to be the vector x contracted into the covariant derivative of y. The covariant derivative of the y, the first term, is y's with the normal partial derivative in the direction in the uh, associated with the same index as the vector x is. That's this part. And this is the connection where I've used this breakdown. I broke it into the symmetric and anti-symmetric parts. So this is this is just the connection broken down in its two parts times the vector itself. So this piece here is actually y alpha double bar sigma, and this whole expression here is x sigma y alpha double bar sigma, and that is this. That's the comp version of that. Okay? So that is the, uh, the first term. The second term is exactly the same thing, but now it's the covariant derivative in the direct of x in the direction y, and that's what this term is. So the key difference here is I've broken the connection into its symmetric and anti-symmetric parts. So now we peel all that apart. And when you peel all that apart, I want to create this thing here, which is ju which just involves the symmetric term. And if you look at this, this looks like this looks like some new thing, which is the covariant derivative in the direction x of y, right? That's that's what this almost looks like, except I've, and the only difference is it's got only the symmetric part. So I have to give it like a new symbol, like maybe uh, a little tilde symbol. And that's supposed to mean x alpha times y 
beta. And now I would normally write covariant derivative alpha here, but it's not really the covariant derivative. It's only the symmetric part of that covariant derivative. So I'd have to create like a new symbol down here, perhaps. I would have to write maybe um, uh, let's say um, maybe my new symbol might be squiggle, squiggle uh, alpha, right? Just to say that it's the symmetric part, right? So it's not quite the same thing, but it's pretty darn close. Anyway, um, so that's what that piece is. And then this piece here, oops, this piece here is the same thing for, for this part, right, where it's the covariant derivative and the direct, the sort of the symmetric version of the covariant derivative in the direction y of x. All I've done is taken these terms and I basically distributed across this and across this and then collected the symmetric part. And then the anti-symmetric part that's left, that's this thing. The problem is, or the good news is, this thing cancels, right? This thing cancels. And the reason it cancels is because if I, uh, if I change the dummy indices here so that the, y, the index on y and x match on this term, I end up with x sigma y beta gamma alpha anti-symmetrized beta sigma plus, and then the sigmas become betas and the betas become sigmas, which we can do because they're dummy indices. I can change these things. I can switch beta to sigma and sigma to beta without any trouble because they're dummy indices, right? Um, alpha, sigma, beta, right? And then once I do that, this becomes beta, that becomes sigma, and then they're out there commuting. So I have this, but I now know that this is, this is by definition anti-symmetric. It's constructed that way. So if I commute these two, I get a minus sign in there. So I can do that using erasers, right? I commute those two, so now I have beta sigma, and then this becomes a minus sign, and therefore the whole thing equals zero. So what have I shown? I've shown I've shown that this sum does not depend at all on the anti-symmetric part of the connection. This goes to zero. It only depends on the symmetric part of the connection. And, and that's really important because what it means is in order to calculate this sum, if I replaced the connection with its symmetric part, I get the same answer. So why is that important? Well, imagine that I have two connections, right? Imagine that I have two different connections available to me. I have uh, uh, nabla and I have nabla squiggle, right? Well, if I create nabla x acting on y, right, and then I add to it nabla y acting on x, and if the only difference between these two connections is its anti-symmetric part, then I know that this is going to equal the same expression uh, uh, with the other connection. Because the only difference between these two connections by my construction is an anti-symmetric part. Just this, just this anti-symmetric part is the only difference. They share the same symmetric part. That's all green. The anti-symmetric part, however, is different. But f as far as this sum goes, that doesn't matter. So those two things are the same. So now I make the following. I, but x and, this is true, by the way, for any x and any y, right? Any two vectors, this is going to be true. Nothing, there's nothing special about x and y here. But now let's introduce something special. Let's imagine we have a curve in space-time. And that curve has a tangent vector. We'll call the curve gamma. We'll call the tangent vector gamma dot, right? And we know that the we know that if I say that x equals y equals gamma dot, I'm now going to get 
2 gamma dot gamma dot equals 2 tilde gamma dot gamma dot. And that's really profound. I just cancel the twos out. And if I assert that this curve is such that this is zero, that means this is the equation for a geodesic. Right? The geodesic equation is the tangent vector along a curve. If you propagate the tangent, if you propagate the tangent vector in the direction of itself along a curve gamma, and you get zero, then that curve gamma is a geodesic curve. That's the definition of a geodesic curve. So the point is, is that these two connections, gamma, uh, connection tilde and connection clean, they give you, they both give you geodesics for the same curve. The same curve gamma will be a geodesic for both of these two connections. And these two connections could differ by a lot. They could differ by an entire anti-symmetric piece. As long as the symmetric piece of these two is the same, the geodesics will be the same. Okay, so now if we consider that and we go back to these assumptions, particles move on geodesics, right? Clearly, it's going to be an important part of our program to study those geodesics. Now, we've calculated the metric connection that depends on this notion, right? And that gives us this metric connection, which the way we've done it, um, the anti-symmetric part of that metric connection was zero because we assumed the torsion was zero. But it makes no difference. If we didn't, we would still get the same geodesics. But this assumption does not affect the most important part of the physical theory, which is the, uh, the geodesics are the same. So there could be, we could say a lot more about this, right? We could go on and on about the torsion and how we could try to intuitively understand what the torsion is, which has to do with sort of the global movement of the reference frame, uh, where along a geodesic, it's not going to ultimately change the components of a vector in parallel transport. We could talk about it in its connection to possible um, coupling to spin and some other weird theories, things that are pretty outside our, our zone right now. But the point is, is by assuming the torsion of, of our connection is zero, what, we're, what we've done is we've just taken, what we're really doing is we're taking the class of all the connections. Well, let's put it this way. We, we have our metric. Presumably our theory gives us the metric. The metric gives us the metric connection. Well, of all the connections that, uh, and, and that defines the geodesics, which tell us how things move in space-time, which is our goal. So metric gives us metric connection, gives us geodesics. Now, had we not assumed torsion was zero, the metric connection could be more complicated than it is. But we've chosen essentially the simplest metric connection that gives us the geodesics relevant to this metric, right? And particles move on the geodesics, so that's kind of what we're after in our theory. And until pieces of the theory critically depend on the torsion, which they, they don't in this theory, because this theory really only depends on, general relativity really only depends on these geodesics, right? That's the, the only thing we need to know. So we're basically, by assuming the torsion is zero, was we're looking for the simplest connection that gives us the geodesics that we want. And that's why it's safe to assume that the torsion is zero. And we've demonstrated that. I've proven that the geodesic equation for, you know, this defines a geodesic, right? When this thing equals zero, I better put the zero on this side, right? When, when, uh, when this is true, gamma is a geodesic. But when it's true for nabla, it's also true for nabla tilde, which is only different from nabla by the anti-symmetric piece, right? And, uh, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we can throw the torsion away. Okay, so that, this was sort of a little bit of an optional lecture, just to, the idea being to keep, uh, one of the goals of, of, my, of my work here is I want to keep the people who are following this when you read these books and you start reading about these assumptions, I don't want these assumptions to leave you in the dust. Because they kind of did to me when I learned about it the first time. I had to go back and say, okay, why is this book not talking about torsion? That sounds very, very interesting. Well, this is the, one of the reasons. There's other reasons, too. 
And there's reasons why torsion is interesting. And there are plenty of professionals in this field who are studying the torsion and looking for modifications to general relativity that include torsion. Um, nothing, I think, has uh, struck enough sparks to make people really, really uh, feel like GR is under a terrible threat. On the other hand, people are saying, you know, it's, it's, there's, just because we haven't measured or seen an effect of torsion on the movement of particles in space-time doesn't mean it isn't there, and it probably should be there, and it's worth spending a career studying. So there are people out there doing that. Um, there is a paper out there. Let me cite a paper for you in case you're really fascinated by this. Um, let me cite a paper. Hold on. All right, this is the paper. So it's called General Relativity with Torsion by Stuart Jensen. I just found it online. Um, by looking up torsion, and I stumbled across the paper. It's really great. Um, what he does is he goes into the book uh, by Wald. Wald has a great book on GR. It's a bit advanced, but I think with the work we're doing here in this class, you should be able to read Wald. Um, and Wald has a chapter on curvature. So the question is, everything in Wald's chapter assumes that the torsion equals zero, right? If the torsion does not equal zero, that's what this paper is about. So this paper goes to Wald's chapter on curvature and line by line goes through it, assuming that the torsion is not equal to zero. And it's pretty interesting. Um, uh, we're not going to cover it here, but uh, and I wouldn't jump into it unless you had some special reason to go into it. Uh, but uh, people are thinking about this, and you have to sort of stop by start by reconstructing general relativity with torsion. We're going to be now defining moving into the curvature tensor and the vial tensor, and we have to understand... Um, those tensors for what they are. They're all going to be understood in the context of torsion equals zero from this point on. And this will be the only lecture we, uh, we discuss on that topic. Okay, see you next time.